ourselves. And before introducing ourselves indi individually, I'd like to introduce EcoCode. So the EcoCode was launched uh, because we saw a lot of misinformation about sustainability and sustainability simply being used as a buzzword everywhere. So we launched EcoCode to educate everybody about sustainability in much more detail. And I'm Hitarsha. I'm a co-founder of the EcoCode. I'm an environmental educator. So I go into schools and hold sustainability sessions. And I have completed my bachelor's from environment, in environmental sciences from the University of Leeds. And I've previously worked at Emirates Environmental Group, the University of Leeds and Agroforestry Academy. And I'm Mia, I'm the second co-founder of the EcoCode. I'm also a sustainability consultant with Globally for the HSBC Living Business Program. I have a master's in environmental economics and climate change from the LSC in the UK. And I've also previously worked with Climate Action in London. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Huda and I'm a sustainability consultant and manager of IDAMA, uh, which is a company based in the UAE. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about IDAMA in a bit, um, but my background is in architecture engineering uh, and I got into the sustainability field by pursuing a master's in sustainable architecture. Um, so IDAMA is basically a social enterprise that promotes sustainable development uh, by supporting schools and organizations uh, as well as communities and embracing sustainability uh, in their practices, um, in services such as uh, education, training, design, research, and more, um, into topics related to uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and I have also on the call here, Natasha, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, hi. Hi, everyone, I'm Natasha. So I don't actually have a background in sustainability. I got into sustainability when I had my kids and started looking at sustainable products and different practices to have better, better options for them. I am a sustainable consultant and a content developer for Idama. I also have a sustainable packaging business called Mr. Bluefish. So I wanna welcome everyone here. Um, you know, we're gonna start talking about zero waste, but since this is a Q and A webinar, we're gonna go right off the bat and start with a question. So what does zero waste mean to you? We wanna hear your opinions. You can type them out in the chat box to everyone, or you can unmute yourself and um, tell us what's, what zero waste means to you. So if you want to start that off, Hitasha, do you wanna start that off? What zero waste means to you? So what zero waste means to me? Um, Zero waste doesn't mean a lot. I mean, zero waste means uh, just to conserve more resources to me, just so I'm not wasting many resources. So wasting resources uh, uh, close to zero, let's say. Um, so yeah, basically just not wasting a lot, conserving more. Does anyone else want to um, talk about what have you heard the term zero waste? Have you not heard the term? Um, is it something completely new or is it something that you've heard of? Have you ever tried it? So uh, Lara saying, reduce what I need, reuse as much as I can, send little to be recycled and compost what I cannot. And that's exactly, yes, what it is. So that's zero waste good. basically started off in the 1970s as a, as something that wasn't ecological. It was actually just a term saying, let's send, let's reuse, uh, it was started by a chemist uh, who said, let me reuse uh, chemical waste from the electronics industry and uh, market it. So more as a business aspect. In 2000s, in the 2000s, zero waste became synonymous with what you see on your screen, the trash jar. Uh, you know, individuals like B.R. Johnson and Lauren Singer basically aimed to make popular this concept where you send nothing to landfill and you recycle as little as possible. So that's where the trash jar comes into place. So this is where all of their trash for the year or two years or however long they practiced their uh, zero waste lifestyle fit into a trash jar. Um, 
uh, Geeta and Ipsita say mindful use of materials, energy, and resources. That's exactly what it is. Uh, my question here now is another question is how, uh, how realistic do you think this trash jar is? How do you think it's possible? Do you think it's, uh, it's, you know, I, is it easy to achieve or is that something that's more idealistic? So what, what do you think is, uh, is zero waste versus what we like to say, low waste? Chloe says, yes, it's possible, but it's not easy. Cohen says, I think it's difficult on the short term. So we, we prefer the term low waste. We want to, even though this is, this we've said this is a zero waste workshop. Uh, personally, I believe that it's quite difficult to achieve. It's uh, like Elizabeth says, low waste is more realistic in the long term. Um, it's difficult to change bad habits. That's Cohen. Talia said, I think it's possible if you really want to make it a part of your daily routine. Yes, it's definitely possible. Mariam says, I think it's possible, but it takes much more time and effort to maintain a zero waste and low waste is more realistic. And Chloe says it takes society. So yes, so we prefer the term uh, uh, low waste. Personally, I have tried to go zero waste and it comes back to low waste. Um, who do you think? Uh, who do you think in started this movement, or you know, basically had a more of an Im low waste impact? So when we say um, who started this movement, I think uh, while we've said, while I've said that Lauren Singer, Bia Johnson in the early, in the early two thousands started this movement, you know, the real true originators of the low waste movement were probably your grandparents. Like they were the ones um, who basically saved and reused everything, created very little waste and tried to sort of control their consumption as far as possible. Uh, Cohen says started by ecologists, yes. Uh, Lara says exactly, my grandmother never threw any food. Um, I think it was probably, Mariam says, individuals who saw waste and their world changing, so decided to help the environment. Yes, absolutely. Um, so while our, our grandparents and eco ecologists said, yes, we're going we're gonna to focus on waste and we're going to focus on saving or reusing as much as possible, uh, there's a, they started off with, uh, with actually taking care of the waste. That's the end of the life cycle. But what about the beginning of the life cycle where we talk about design, where we actually create a product that is not meant to be wasted at, uh, at the end of its life cycle. So what we have is basically uh, two types of economic models. We have a linear economy, which is what we currently are in. It is the take, make and dispose economy. Uh, basically we take materials from the environment, we take raw materials, we use energy, we make a product and then at the end of its life cycle, we are disposing it, throwing it away, sending it to landfill. Um, just the way nature recycles everything, right? We have water recycling, we have uh, air and nutrients. Uh, circular economy basically is a closed loop uh, system of using materials. So basically we take uh, materials from uh, the environment, use it, uh, reuse it, um, repurpose it, maybe recycle it, uh, using as few emissions as possible, uh, keeping the materials uh, circulating within the economy as possible, and putting it back into production. So this is a circular economy where we work towards creating um, a loop, a closed loop of systems and reducing waste as much as possible. This is much more difficult than say what we as individuals can do in terms of low waste. So which brings us to our next question. Hi, so now that we've learned about um, low waste and zero waste and circular economy, we wanna start off by asking you 
what is your favorite low waste hack and how has it benefited you? I'll start off by answering that actually. So my favorite low waste hack is using coconut oil for moisturizing and shaving purposes. How has it benefited me? I save a lot of money because I do not buy a lot of creams to shave or moisturize anymore. And I don't use a lot of chemicals on my body as a result of that as well. However, hacks like these need to be tested properly on a small patch of your skin before thinking about redu uh, using it regularly and buying it to redu uh, use it regularly. So what are your answers to this? Um, Feel free to unmute yourselves to answer or tell us in the chat. Okay. okay. I see a lot of answers here. So Simran says, uh, Ayurveda practices low waste too. So yeah, that is basically ancient Indian medicine. Uh, Elizabeth says she's, uh, she brings her own bags to the store. Lara keeps vegetables pe keeps vegetable peels to create vegetable stock and then compost the remains. Very good. And that helps her save cost and it helps the soil. That's very, very important. Elizabeth started composting on her balcony. Well done. Keon started composting as well. Amazing. And a really weird one. My mom taught me. Uh, my mom taught me would be making homemade, homemade deodorants. Okay, with herbs, and she doesn't buy store bought plastic and metal deodorants. Well done, Maria. Any more? I'm sure we have more than, more than the people on the chat on at the actual webinar. It's amazing. Taking away leftover food from the restaurant, very important. Yes, reduce food waste. Taking reusable bags when you go to the store, that's amazing. Not, not using things just for single purpose. Yes, reusing is a very good way to also be very sustainable. Composting again, ordering as much as you can eat using kitchen tissues for cleaning, repurposing old clothes. So yeah, that's a lot. That's what very is, what good. Is, what is uh, quite popular here uh, yes. these days is uh, Too Good To Go. I don't know if you're aware about it. It's too Good To yes. Go. It's uh, an app that you have on your um, on your phone. <clears throat> and it um, you can screen what, what uh, restaurants or uh, uh, supermarkets uh, have uh, food that uh, they're about to throw away. And they, uh, they give it uh, for, uh, for a small price. You can That's, it amazing. For That's a very good initiative. It's too good to go in the UAE. No, La, I haven't seen too good to go in the UAE. However, I have seen another organization start this. I will find the name and send it to everyone at the end of this session. Use products until they're, they're completely empty, yes. Okay, so yeah, we've got loads of answers. Well done for taking for making a start uh, to adopt a low waste lifestyle. Every all changes matter, and they all contribute to a big change as well. So yes, yeah, that's are. amazing. We are yeah. an impressive bunch, Lara. Yeah. And these are some low waste bathroom swaps that we had listed here, and some of these are our favorite as well. And our group in EcoCode and Idama. And yeah, now that we know about people's different uh, low, favorite low waste hacks and their benefits, we will talk about a product life cycle. So every product has its own journey. And that is exactly what a product life cycle is. So it starts off with raw materials being extracted and then uh, that going into manufacturing and production of the product. And then the product is packaged and distributed. Then we consumers buy the product, we use it and maintain it, and then we dispose it off. This is a generic product life cycle. In a low waste, life, in a low waste product life cycle, there would be many uh, more steps. And as uh, low waste consumers, we would have to question these steps I, at each uh, part of the life cycle. So firstly, 
when the materials are being extracted and manufactured, we need to ask ourselves and maybe even do some research on if their practices are as ethical as possible. And when they're packaging, uh, do they use low impact or eco-friendly packaging? When this product is being loaded into the transport for, distrib uh, for distribution, uh, we need to see if they either use electrical transport or they at least fully load their transport to reduce the environmental impact of transporta transporting the product. And then it comes down to us consumers. Uh, we Before buying the product, we must question uh, how reusable this product is and at the end of its life, how upcyclable or recyclable it is. And that also applies to the packaging. And after buying it and using it sustainably, we should send it to the right channel for proper waste management, or we could send it to back to the manufacturer. And this leads us to our next question. So how has adopting low waste hacks made you question your consumer habits? And Huda, would you actually want to start us off by answering this one? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, one of the ways that I changed my habits, you know, after pursuing low waste is mainly through my biggest weakness was just shopping. So I love shopping and I'm always looking to follow, you know, the latest trends or the colors of the season and so on. And I wasn't really aware of the, you know, the ecological footprint behind fashion. Um, so I would still, you know, shop a lot. And now before I pursue anything or in, in terms of shopping, I, I have to think how many times can I actually wear this item and how many different ways could I wear it? Not just how many times I could wear it, because it's it, it's a you know it's a big deal. Uh, so you know that's my that's my experience here. That's amazing. What about the others? What are your um, how do you question your consumer habits and how do you con how would you question it? Um, uh, <clears throat> I question my consumer habits with respect to buying uh, water. So if you go to the supermarket here in, um, in my country, you see a lot of brands uh, offering uh, water, just plain water. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, um, you realize that, uh, yeah, well, that, that, that water is packed in, in plastic bottles. It's a lot of um, extra waste, whereas we, we have uh, water coming out of the tap. But, um, but I, I never liked so much the, the, the taste of the water that comes out of the tap. Because there's uh, quite some, uh, there's some chlorine too for disinfection, I suppose, uh, in the water. But it turns out that if you just pour, put it in a bottle and you leave it standing for a um, for a for a short while, then this 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 taste, uh, this chlorine taste, is 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 is, um, is gone. So oh. it's uh, actually um, you can this this water is perfect to drink, and uh, I don't need to go um, buy uh, bottles of water anymore in the supermarket. Oh, that's amazing. So you've reduced your plastic consumption. It's, uh, it's from water pretty boxes. simple, but it's pretty simple. But uh, you, you just have to, 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 to put the, the water in, in a bottle for, for a short while. So the, I think the chlorine comes out. Um, and then it's okay. Right. <laughs> okay. I have never heard of that method, but it does sound very promising. And also, oh, yes, on the chat, we have Alicia saying, uh, mine is shopping as well, but I always search secondhand. Very good. That's a very good to reduce your environmental impact. Um, I'm not sure if Elizabeth said this now or before, but she said the waste created before the product got to me. I also think about it if I find it gently used. Okay. And Mariam says, I genuinely think that low waste hacks are so important in the, this day and age that you don't need to spend more money or use products that have caused pollution being produced. And you can also use a old t-shirt as a cloth, for example. Yes, upcycling is the way. And Alicia says, I agree, we must give current resources a new life. Mariam says, or using that empty shampoo bottle instead of buying one as well as that instead of buying like face masks or making them on your own, yeah, make stuff on your own. That is a very good way to do that as well. Laura tries to choose local brands and now more than global brands. Yes, this is a very good way to make an effective impact. 
Natasha says, oh yes, less, uh, less stuff, less space, so she can save space. That's a very good benefit. Talia goes shopping and used to have a lot of bags, but now she takes reusable bags and reusable water bottles and still plastic. Very good. And Koyan says, I use water from that and that I use for rinsing food afterwards to water the plants and give it a second life. That's amazing. Simon says, shop local. So these are all very amazing responses, everybody. Very, very good. And at EcoCode, actually, we had made a tree chart for everybody to, uh, to help everyone to question their consumer habits. So we can go to the tree chart now. So every time uh, you want to buy something, you ask yourself a question. You ask yourself, do I actually even need it? Do I truly need it? Or is it just a want that I will think of uh, now and not think of uh, three days later and just not actually need it, see? And then if no, don't buy it. That's money and resources saved already. If yes, ask yourself if you can upcycle to create this. If yes, go for upcycling it. If not, ask yourself if you can borrow this thing, buy this thing secondhand or rent it if it's safe to. If yes, go for those options. If not, ask yourself if this thing that you want is available at a local or ethical brand. And if it would be best if it's both a local and ethical brand. And if yes, uh, make uh, do know that these brands may be a little pricier. And if you're willing to spend more money, you can buy from a local and ethical brand. If this is not an option, you can buy from a conventional brand. However, buying from a conventional brand should always be your last option. However, this tree chart does not apply to things like medical and healthcare products, alcohol, and pet food. So please do be careful when you're using this tree chart. Only make sure to use it for things like shopping, makeup, and all of that. All right. And now we'll... Uh, so from everything we've heard so far, obviously this zero waste, low waste lifestyle seems to be the obvious choice or the correct choice for us as well as the planet. But making this transition is obviously not as easy as people may think, and there are so many challenges involved with that. So we're going to talk about uh, some of the ch general challenges that people tend to face when they adopt a low-waste lifestyle. But before we do, do you guys want to share some challenges you faced when you uh, came across uh, trying to adopt this low-waste lifestyle? You guys can unmute yourself if you want to say it out loud, or you can write it in the chat box. I think I would say like fast fashion yeah is like a huge one for me because like I used to shop on like Sheen and stuff and now I like I rethink yeah yeah fast fashion is a very difficult one because you always want to stay stay trendy but uh, yeah also yeah easy to do that when you want to follow a low waste lifestyle Okay, so Lara says COVID made it more challenging, especially with more uh, wrapping for hygienic purposes. That's so true. Uh, I know restaurants for some time had to use a disposable cutlery uh, because of COVID, so it did make it a bit more challenging. Alicia says finding zero waste products locally, such as beauty products and bulk bins. Yes, that's a challenge I think a lot of people do tend to face, just you know, not having the means of uh, shopping zero waste. Anyone else? I kind of have the same problem as like Alicia, like when I buy like glue on eyelashes and then I throw away the eyelashes and then I get new ones. It like kind of takes a lot of like packaging and stuff and it well, it's not good for the environment. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, not all products are currently made to be reusable. So um, we just have to do our best and uh, buy the ones that are made for, for reusing. Uh, Lara also mentioned pricing. Low-waste products tend to be pricier. 
um, that that is a point. They do tend to be pricier in the short run, but um, in the long run, it can actually save you a lot of money. Uh, Natasha, availability of products and clothing that fit a low waste lifestyle, yes. Uh, and Marceline uh, says segregating waste is quite hard in some public places since there is only one dustbin for everything. That's so true. Not all countries have uh, that option of segregating your waste or recycling your waste. So that's true. Um, well, these are all great responses and definitely some of the challenges you guys have mentioned are ones that we all at IDAMA and the EcoCode have faced ourselves as well. So why don't I take you, some of, take you through some of the general challenges that we noticed pe most people do tend to face with this um, lifestyle. So the first one is this all in, all out mindset. So people who try to adopt this uh, low waste lifestyle or who are interested in learning more about it tend to be bombarded with uh, messages that encourage us to do certain things like to stop using plastic completely. And these are obviously big lifestyle changes. So there is a tendency for us to get overwhelmed by the whole thing and just decide to opt out completely if you feel like you can't commit fully to this uh, lifestyle. And now this is a mindset that says, if you can't truly be zero waste, then why even try to minimize your waste at all? Or if you can't be completely plastic free, let's not even try to cut back on plastic. But when it comes to this, this low waste lifestyle, it's really better to be imperfectly low waste than to not try at all because small conscious changes are really better than um, no changes at all. And the way that you can start is just by focusing on one action that you can actually control and make a commitment to do that well, but also remember to not be so hard on yourself when that commitment doesn't work out or you, um, you know, aren't able to fully commit that thing. A second challenge that I think a lot of people tend to face is also your surrounding. And by this, I mean your um, friends, family, and other individuals who can influence um, your decisions. So uh, for example, when I first started my low waste journey, I remember uh, sometimes I'd get odd looks or odd comments or questions uh, for some of my sustainable actions. Um, for example, when I would refuse a plastic straw in a restaurant um, or when I would refuse a plastic bag in a grocery store and then I'd end up carrying all my products in my arms uh, on the way home because I forgot my reusable bag. And obviously having these looks or comments from people, it, it does, uh, it, it is a bit off-putting at first, but now a lot of my friends and family have adopted these sustainable actions too. And um, I think one of the best things to do here is to explain to these individuals um, why you're doing the actions that you are. Um, and this can help raise awareness and hopefully get them on board this uh, low waste lifestyle as well. Um, a third challenge that uh, I think a lot of people face, and I, I noticed from the comments that you guys have faced too, is the accessibility of low waste products. So the truth is uh, most things in this world are created so that we have to make as little effort as possible to get something. So this can range from food to clothes to beauty products. Um, everything is basically just a click away from us and it's all so fast and effective that it's created for a quick consumption without letting you think about the possible negative impacts that your consumption may have and this of course makes it hard for those of us who are trying to be conscious consumers for example if you go into a supermarket or into just a normal store it's very hard and takes a lot of effort to find something that isn't packaged or um to find something that is created for reuse or is refillable. Um, it seems almost like everything you touch in a supermarket or just any store is made to be discarded once that product reaches the end of its life. And unfortunately, we're not all lucky to have zero waste shops or um, conscious marketplace, marketplaces around us. Um, and obviously this can put off a lot of people from even trying to be conscious shoppers when being unconscious is the easier option, right? Uh, but what you can do is, you know, even when you are in these standard shops or standard supermarkets, there are ways that you can be a conscious shopper. So one of the simplest one, which I see a lot of people have already adopted is taking your own reusable bag 
or just taking your own containers for loose products, or even just using the chart that uh, Hitasha showed us just a while ago, um, and just initiating that 5R mindset of refusing, reducing, reusing, repurposing, and recycling. So these are all ways that you can overcome this challenge. Um, a fourth challenge that people tend to face is this challenge of planning and the time that it takes to adopt this low waste lifestyle. So obviously uh, you can't become low waste overnight. It takes a bit of mental planning to implement before it becomes a habit. Um, and this initial step can really put off a lot of people from adopting the lifestyle at all. So uh, uh, an example for, from when I started my journey was I, I remember I would constantly forget to wash my um, reusable makeup pads. So I would end up using a single use cotton pad. And that would you know, make me feel bad because I've put this effort all along, but then I, I, I go one step back because I just forgot to wash something. Um, but this again ties in with my first point with you don't constantly need to be perfect at this lifestyle. You're going to forget things uh, at first and that's okay, but eventually it will become a habit just as with any other uh, lifestyle. Uh, the final challenge is greenwashing. Now, before we get into this uh, challenge and what greenwashing is and how you can avoid it, I wanna ask you guys, um, have you ever been greenwashed or have you ever experienced greenwashing or even what is your definition of greenwashing? You guys can unmute yourselves if you want to share an experience or you could type it in the chat box and I'll read it out. I think uh, greenwashing is like, um, it's like uh, using some ideas and pretending that that uh, what you do is, is good for the environment, but actually there are some, it's, it's not that good or there. It's just, um, it's just, um, just in the, the marketing or, or the, let's say to, to, to work on the perception, but not on, on, the, on the basics, I think. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it is. Um, do, have you ever been greenwashed yourself? Uh, probably, but I don't always realize, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, a lot of us don't realize it, or when we realize it's obviously too late. <laughs> um, anyone else want to share anything? Want to share an experience? I actually think a lot of shoe brands, like greenwash and like, and like shampoos and like conditioners and stuff, they're all greenwash. Like I, I bought like shampoos and stuff, which I thought were like, you know, zero waste, but they ended up being like the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah, that's happened to me as well, for sure. Um, Gita and Ipsita say items which appear to be sustainable or eco-friendly, but are not actually so. Uh, for example, often organic veggies are not organic and we pay a lot more thinking we are buying organic. That's very true. Um, and that's also a great definition of greenwashing. Um, okay, then uh, let's get into what greenwashing is and how we can spot it and avoid it. So first, to give a more formal definition of greenwashing, uh, greenwashing is basically when a product or a business uh, says they're green or eco-friendly, but they spend more resources on making sure that you know that they're green or eco-friendly rather than actually implementing this into their uh, business practices. And some ways that you can spot greenwashing is, uh, for example, fluffy language or words which don't really have a clear meaning. So pure and natural or eco-friendly, you know, these are not exactly well-defined word, well words. So, I mean, what, what, what does it mean when a product says it's eco-friendly? Like which part of it is eco-friendly? Is it actually eco-friendly? Um, Another way to spot it is uh, through green images that indicate a green impact. Um, so for example, a green colored packaging with flowers blooming out of exhaust pipes, you know, just because you paint something green uh, doesn't make it uh, any more eco-friendly or uh, green than it is. Um, and yeah, you can see some of these images on the slide. So again, just because you paint something green doesn't make it any different than what it was originally. Okay, um, and when you do spot some of these, uh, you know, awesome green claims, 
uh, the first and foremost thing to do is to do your research. So go to the company's website uh, and usually companies that are truly sustainable, they will be more transparent, transparent on, uh, for example, the kinds of materials they use, uh, where they manufacture, what kinds of policies and programs they have to um, ensure, for example, fair wages or uh, ensure that they're reducing pollution. Um, and if you can't find this information on their website, uh, you can also get in touch with the company itself. And if they truly are putting all this work into being sustainable, they will be more than happy and proud to share this information with you. Another way you can avoid uh, greenwashing is to look past these fancy covers and empty marketing terms and instead look for reliable certificates um, on tags and uh, packaging. So just checking labels. And that's what Natasha is going to take um, through for us uh, in the next slide. So um, if you're looking at products and you're looking to buy, like we're discussing beauty products or even food products, and uh, if you see any of these certifications, you can without, and if you don't have time to do the research, you can at least be assured that you're buying something that has uh, some good impact or value behind it. So one all encompassing uh, certification is certified B Corporation. So this is basically where the entire company has been certified uh, to not only uh, create a product or their products are healthy for the consumer, they're protecting the environment, but as a company, they also do good for their employees. Uh, the next one is uh, the Leaping Bunny certification. This is for products that have not been tested on animals, not their partners or uh, any of their manufacturing units. They've not been tested on animals. The next one is an EWG certification. This one's a great one for beauty products. It is uh, quite stringent and it's tested for non-toxic uh, ingredients and it's made sure it's safe for humans. Uh, the other one is, um, sorry, I can't see my screen. Yeah, a certified vegan. Uh, again, this is uh, made sure that all the ingredients are vegan, including insect and animal free, and it hasn't been tested on animals. The cradle to cradle certification, which is the next one, it basically is for products, uh, manufacturers, and for companies who are, who are uh, scored against a, a circular economy. So products and manufacturing, which basically align with the circular economy concept. Uh, Made Safe is again, another great certification for uh, non-toxic ingredients, not just for beauty products, but also for uh, like mattresses and toys. Uh, so anything with a Made Safe logo has been tested for uh, safety for uh, against chemicals and toxic ingredients. The USDA, that's the next one. The USDA uh, organics, basically the USDA, um, monitors uh, organic ingredients in food, uh, not necessarily in uh, beauty products, but if you look at the labels and if you see an asterisk, it will show you which uh, ingredients are organic uh, in, in a beauty product. A FSC certified, so FSC is Forest Steward Council, Forest Stewardship Council. This is more for packaging. So if you have products that are packaged in paper, uh, forest uh, FSC certified paper is basically uh, sourced, is timber sourced from forests that are, um, you know, are, are grown and are uh, looked after without uh, chemicals and are safe for, uh, for, for, for the making, for making paper. Eco certified, uh, Eco cert is again, uh, is a certification for ingredients in cosmetics. Uh, they checked for safety, they checked for organic ingredients and they checked for, uh, make sure that they, they, they don't include hazardous and um, uh, chemicals that are not, uh, are not safe for human uh, skin. The UAE has uh, its own certification. It's called the ESMA UAE Organic. Uh, this again is for uh, test. Uh, this again is for products that have been tested and are certified as organic. So, if you're looking for uh, a quick and easy way to look for 
um, products that you can buy without thinking. There are a lot more certifications. There's um, a website which we link uh, when we send this out and it will it, it actually gives you certifications by country. So you can have um, more than uh, 200 countries with 455 labels that uh, certifications that um, you can take a look at. All right. Thank you so much. So now that we've learned about the challenges uh, of adopting a low waste lifestyle, and we've learned about greenwashing and how to overcome it, uh, we will put out another question. So who do you think is responsible to make a shift towards a circular economy and hence a low waste lifestyle? Uh, you can unmute yourselves to answer or you could also put it in the chat box. So I will open now and yes, each one of us, that's correct. Consumers, producers, government regulations, yes, everyone. Okay. Does anybody think it should be just our responsibility as individuals to do it or just the government? We should not wait for others to do the job. Okay, yes, we must take action. Um, consumers must hold companies to a higher standard. Okay, that's also a very good answer. Anyone think otherwise? Okay, I'm guessing not. So, right, in order to answer this question, there's actually two approaches we'll talk about today. So there's the bottom up approach and the top down approach. So the bottom up approach is basically about influencing policy change through behavior change. So individual actions like adopting a low waste lifestyles may encourage companies to produce more mindfully and that would also encourage work towards sustainable goal uh, sustainable development goal number 12, which is about responsible consumption and production. And collective action could also possibly lead to policy changes as well. And an example of a bottom-up approach that we have here is the Greta effect. So most of us would have heard of Greta Thunberg. She is an environmental activist from Sweden. And she is known for challenging world leaders to take action against uh, climate change. So she started off her journey uh, all alone outside the Swedish parliament in 2018, where she started protesting alone. And then she soon grew this into a global movement where she got more than 10 million people from all over the world onto the streets to, um, to sorry, to protest against environmental degradation. So that is Greta Thunberg, that's what she has done. And a study showed that people who were more familiar with Greta Thunberg, they actually uh, thought their actions uh, of, uh, for example, adopting a low waste lifestyle were more meaningful and effective to protest for climate action. And although Greta hasn't had any, uh, she hasn't led to her, the Greta effect hasn't really led to any policy changes. It has motivated people to speak up and act against um, environmental degradation. And even though these examples that I'm going to mention now are not directly related to Greta Thunberg and the effect that she's created, these examples have definitely occurred um, after, uh, since or after 2018. So, so that's when Greta came about with her protests. So one of the examples is uh, that in, since 2018, there was a rise in the demand for green beauty products with low impact packaging. And a bigger example is in India, actually. So there is a city called Mumbai. And in Mumbai, there is a forest called the Are Forest, which is known as the lungs of Mumbai. So this forest was uh, proposed to be cut down in order to build a shed for Mumbai's metro. 
However, people heard this and they were quite against this. And they came together both virtually and physically to protest against that. And that actually shifted the date of the project. And we hope that uh, people would continue to protest now virtually um, in order to, you know, keep postponing that and eventually maybe even stop that from happening. We also have dollar voting as a bottom-up approach. So dollar voting is basically about spending uh, your money and voting with the money you spend. And every time we buy a new product, we cast a vote in the market to increase demand for that product. So for example, Think of it like this, you want to buy soap and then you would have two choices. Do I go and buy soap uh, from a conventional store that has harmful chemicals and comes in plastic packaging? Or do I go and buy soap from maybe a smaller, more ethical brand that makes soap without harmful chemicals and packs it in low waste packaging? So whatever you buy, you create a demand for that product with your money. However, sometimes bigger conventional brands may use this idea of dollar voting to greenwash people. They may make green claims and then that may incline people to buy their products, even though it's not very sustainable. So like me and Natasha said before, whenever any, uh, you see any green claims, please do your research, look out for labels. And then only then, if you think it is actually sustainable, you can buy that product. And we also have the top down approach. So this is quite opposite from the bottom up approach and it's basically influencing behavior change through policy change. And there's a few examples of this too. And one way uh, this approach could be used is by governments, uh, authorities in general, promoting the rise of green businesses through different regulations. So a, an example of a regulation would be command and control regulations. And these are basically different standards like pollution standards, energy performance standards, waste regulations. And these would have to be put in place and businesses would have no choice but to stick to these standards in, avoid, in order to avoid further environmental degradation. So for example, if you have a transportation company, let's say, that helps with the distribution of products, maybe uh, an authority would tell that transportation company, you cannot pollute uh, more nitrogen oxide, let's say, um, than a certain amount. And the company would have to stick to that amount by using different means. Otherwise, they would have to face a lot of consequences, for example, being heavily fined for not following that rule. We also have market-based instruments. And market-based instruments basically deliver environmental outcomes with the least cost. And that leads to better um, economic growth and better quality of environment. And a Example of this is the environmental tax. So for example, in the UK, a landfill tax was introduced and this meant that businesses uh, were basically charged more if they put their waste into the landfill rather than being mindful with their waste. And the amount of waste therefore reduced from 50 million tons in 2001 to 12 million tons in 2015. There's also information disclosure. So this is when organizations can disclose information about their environmental performance, and that would allow consumers and investors to make a informed choice. And environmental agencies could also encourage firms to implement pollution control and waste minimization through many, many strategies. And one other way uh, the top-down approach could be used is by authorities working to implement proper waste management in their countries. So a lot of time what happens is when we want to buy a low waste product uh, that might come in low impact packaging, they may, there may not actually be a 
channel for appropriate disposal of their products so that it doesn't end up in landfill. Therefore, we might sometimes just stick to buying the cheaper conventional thing because we think, oh, well, you know, there's no, um, there's no facility to manage the end of life for this product anyway. So I'll just stick to mine. So what governments could do to help here is to implement proper waste management facilities in their country. So people are encouraged to buy more low waste products with um, low waste packaging. We also have education. So environmental education is very important and making it compulsory in schools would be amazing because as a young individual, when we learn about environmental education or anything, environmental uh, issues and solutions, sorry, or anything at all really, that information is ingrained into our minds and we develop on that information as we grow up. And in, uh, in the case of learning about environmental issues and solutions, that may lead those individuals to becoming more, uh, living a more low waste life in future or simply just demanding better for a sustainable world. And an example here is Italy. So in 2019, Italy uh, became the first country to require climate change study in schools and they would they were they proposed that they would study topics such as ocean pollution renewable resources and sustainable living and they would also um, study subjects like geography and physics from a sustainable development perspective so yeah that is an um that is another top-down approach however like everybody said that everybody in this world is responsible for a more sustainable world. And, that's some, um, and that approach would be called a polycentric approach, which mixes both the bottom up and the top down approach. So basically everybody works together to contribute to a more sustainable world. Any questions so far, by the way? Okay, I don't see any questions. Any questions about any of the sections? Sorry, we forgot to ask that. Yes, I have a question. Yes. It's, um, it's a term that um, came up um, uh, a bit earlier in the session. It's about upcycling. upcycling. I didn't catch uh, very well what, what, what this means. So upcycling is basically when you have, uh, when you already have something and you don't really use it, you know, and you want to make something else out of it. So for example, you have an old t-shirt. I think one of our members had mentioned this in the chat before, sorry, I don't remember your name, uh, but she said that, um, well, you know, you could use an old t-shirt, cut it up and make it into a kitchen cloth. And that would uh, prevent that uh, resource into go from going to the landfills. Okay, so you give it yeah. a second life, but it's not really like because if you say upcycling, it's it sounds a bit like upgrading. So you you but you yeah. upgrade it from the waste from the waste at sea, but it's uh, I would rather say it's a kind of um, well because it it's it will end end up as waste in the end, but you give it. Um, Another, another, um, uh, another life, yeah. Like, another, yeah, another yeah. second essentially, life, yeah. yeah. Essentially, you are upgrading it because when this old product has reached that end of life, you know, it's, it's not really a product you can use anymore or you want to use anymore. Um, you are turning it into something that is usable, so you are upgrading it into a better product, let's say. So, you're okay. repurposing it essentially, yeah, yeah. Um, any more questions, guys? Are there any of the terms or terminology or even just general questions regarding your challenges or um, your waste hacks that you want to talk about before we move forward? Um, 
I'm guessing that's the name. Oh, wait, I heard somebody just now. Sorry. Okay, maybe that was just me. Um, okay, then. Okay, so we give it to Huda now. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to recap on basically everything my colleagues have mentioned and your input as well, uh, we've created this mind map as we went along. Uh, so this concludes kind of um, or shows an overview of the low waste uh, concept, uh, starting with the definition, uh, which we all agreed that it would be about conserving or finding a mindful use of resources. And also um, uh, remembering the five R's, which is uh, refuse, reuse, reduce, recycle, and then rot or uh, compost. Um, we then moved on to a circular economy. So, so we mentioned that we need to understand how the product cycle uh, goes on uh, from the product stage, from creating the product in the manufacturing to where it's packaging and uh, transport uh, and how we have to make sure that it could go on and be upcycled or have a, another use at the end. Um, and then we went on to hacks. So a lot of you mentioned that you already started using different zero waste hacks, even if it's just by uh, finding the right products at the supermarket or having products at home that you could put together to create something else instead of buying, for example, like deodorants or any beauty products. Um, uh, moving on to challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is fast fashion, uh, greenwashing. And at the moment, like many of you mentioned uh, COVID, uh, made us uh, also, it gave us like another challenge to think about because uh, we are kind of forced to use, uh, using a lot of single use and disposable um, material. Uh, another challenge would be like the influence of the society, uh, which also impacts uh, our decisions. Um, moving on, uh, consumer habits. So uh, this is also related to the hacks. Uh, we could think about secondhand shopping. So um, uh, the secondhand shopping wasn't really a popular thing here in the UAE, but I think now we have a few um, brands that popped up, which uh, which support this, uh, which is also like, this is an amazing initiative to start here in the UAE, uh, but it's a, it's a common concept used uh, around the world. So uh, this is something that maybe we should think about here. Um, and then towards the end, we discussed responsibility. So uh, the main two concepts here are everyone, is, uh, is you know, involved, uh, policy change through behavior change, and then also behavior change from policy change. Um, and that brings us to, to the end of um, our discussion. So uh, um, here are some um, companies, let's say, or uh, yeah, companies search up and see what they're doing towards uh, low waste. Uh, if you would like to, um, you know, uh, find out more about how you could deal with it here in the UAE, um, we could share these with you as well. These are some in India, and we are we also have something from the UK. Um, yeah, and that brings us to the end of our session. Uh, we can move on now to any further questions you guys have uh, for us. Uh, we'd be happy to help. Uh, otherwise, we could send you um, a few links uh, in the chat or um, by email. So does anyone have any questions? Um, what advice do you have for people that want to save like as much waste as they can? So reducing your waste, you mean? Yeah, like just like recycling more and like not reusing bags and stuff like that. So it comes with different aspects in your life, right? I mean, like there's no one answer which will just uh, help you save all this waste from going to landfill. But I think the best thing is, you know, the, the, the chart that Hitasha showed, I think is a great place to start because you start thinking about whether you need these products and can you reuse these products? Can you repurpose these products? And essentially you get to that five R mindset of like refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, um, repurpose. Um, so that, I think that would be my answer for that. But if you have more specific questions of like how to reduce your waste in a specific area, we can help out with that as well. Do you know if there's any like makeup brands or like small businesses that like are like cruelty free and stuff like that and like don't use like a lot of plastic packaging and stuff like that? Uh, which country um, are you Dubai? from? 
Right, so I think we might have some on the screen that we had earlier, right? Yeah, sorry, there's been an issue with this. I'm just going to reshare it. Yeah. But yeah, um, while I reshare it, I want to add that we will be sending everybody the, the, list, of the, the list of companies, yes. It's just opening again. Uh, while Hitasha opens that, you can also look uh, into, like when you buy a makeup brand, you can uh, look for like glass packaging, which has become quite popular right now, which is less uh, polluting than plastic packaging, of course. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there are some places which allow you to kind of refill um, your makeup. So for example, if you have like those powder, um, you know, the powder foundation, or I, I can't remember what it's called exactly. But yeah, you can remove just the part that you finished and then replace it with uh, the, the powder again. So you can keep the whole packaging of it and just refill that. I know a lot of uh, luxury brands do that right now. And I think some of the medium to low end ones do as well. I have one more question. Um, so like, what can we do in like the UAE kind of to encourage like sustainability, like environmentally? So raise awareness where you can. If, if you are taking some actions which are sustainable, educate people on those, educate your friends. Or if you have you know, social media, share this information there. Just try to spread the word out as much as possible. Okay, thanks. Um, I had kind of like a broad question, but I just wanted to know um, what like sparked your guys' interest in like um, reducing waste and everything. Okay, so there's, uh, who wants to start? I don't mind starting. Um, so what actually sparked my interest in reducing waste? Um, so I started reducing waste as a teenager, but what mostly sparked my interest to start that was uh, saving money. So the less I used, the more money I saved. And that's something that sparked my interest. And then as I did more research into this, I learned that there's many more impacts. And yeah, uh, from then I've just grown into uh, learning more about sustainability and adopting a low waste lifestyle. What about the others? Natasha, do you want to share yours? So uh, yeah, sure. So basically I actually got into sustainability when I was mindlessly scrolling through Facebook. And I saw this photograph of, um, of a turtle with like a plastic ring. So this was like a beer can ring, you know, the six pack beer can ring around its neck. And it was basically obviously being, uh, uh, sorry, around its, uh, around its shell and entire body. So not the neck, but the entire body. So imagine this entire turtle has grown and the, the the plastic has squeezed its its middle, and so if you, if I did a lot more, I did a, a lot of research and a lot of morbid pictures came up, and that basically was like the shock of uh, you know what are we doing to our environment? You know, as a species, we are creating so much waste. We are not being mindful of. Uh, any of the other animals, and uh, I also had my kids around the same time and trying to find products that were safe and non-toxic for them to use. That was the other part of the research that I was doing. So I spent a lot of time uh, just looking up uh, and reading as much as I can and educating myself, uh, you know, on, on sustainability and on uh, different products. Madame, do you want to share your story? Yeah, sure. So my, my journey started three years ago uh, when I was uh, doing my master's in sustainable architecture. Um, I was we were more focused on the building use, actually. And uh, that's where where things started, you know, where I got alarmed of, you know, the problems that we have. Like the construction industry is uh, responsible for like a third of the uh, greenhouse emissions and, you know, so on. And everything we're doing at the moment from terms of, you know, initiating or constructing buildings is also uh, done in an in a in a you know incorrect manner, uh, so that's how uh, things started with me. Yeah, and uh, for me, it's also mainly through education and uh, talking to people as well. 
so I grew up in the UAE and at that time, you know, up until the age of 16, we never really talked about sustainability. It wasn't really uh, a trend, let's say, or it wasn't something that you discussed. Um, but then I moved to the UK around 16 uh, for my higher education. And that's where, you know, you started becoming more aware of uh, a lot of the things that are going on with that planet. Um, and I was studying economics at the time, but my sister had started studying environmental management. So I would read a lot of the articles that she would have for her coursework as well. And I remember just thinking how unfair it was that, um, you know, it's, some of us are just not feeling the, the impact of, for example, climate change at all, whereas other countries um, are just, you know, they're, they're seeing very devastating impacts. Like I remember reading about uh, farmers in India committing suicide because their crops wouldn't grow due to the climate conditions. Or just, for example, the Maldives, knowing that that's no longer going to be a, you know, an island, it's going to go um, under because of the sea level rise. It just was quite unfair that, uh, you know, some people are just not going to have their homes or not going to be able to live as well as others because of all of our actions. So yeah, that's really, so then, then I started doing my master's in environmental economics and climate change and I just became more and more passionate. I started working with climate action and that just really like, I think that's where the spark happened. And uh, since then, yeah, it's, it's been going <laughs> well. Any more questions? Yes, I have a question about this. So coming back to the waste, um, waste. Huh? So don't you think that this is this um, action for, for, for reducing waste is a very unequal battle? Because like in one of the slides, uh, uh, what what's what's you, you, you present this, um, this, uh, let's say this tree where you come to, to, to uh, one of the one of the conclusions is uh, don't buy it. Huh? Don't buy the product. Uh, um, in many cases, you yes, indeed, this slide. Huh? So buy uh, or buy from from from. Um, in many cases, I think uh, you would say don't buy it uh, as a conclusion. Eh? But but you're, uh, this is in, in contra contradiction to, to to the objective of 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 most companies. I would say they want to sell stuff and and uh, get. Uh, gets uh, the sales numbers uh, high. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely they want to get the sales numbers high, but you also have to choose what you demand, right? So your demand as a consumer has such a, a power. So when you're demanding products that you know are polluting or are bad for the environment, you're essentially signaling to these uh, producers that, oh, we want more of this product. Um, and we don't care about the environment, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, don't buy it if you don't need it, of course. Um, and if there are alternatives which are more beneficial for the environment or don't have as bad of an impact, um, then opt for those, of course, because as a consumer, your demand really has a lot of power. Yeah. And I think a good example to back that up would be there wasn't a very big market for uh, plant-based, uh, so like processed plant-based food um, in the past. But now like we have things like Beyond Meat Burgers to actually cater to vegan people. So, you know, the better demand you create, the better the producer will produce. Yeah, I saw recently that um, Adidas is fabricating is going to fabricate a shoe yes. and that is made of that is made of something uh, it's like uh, plastic related to champignon or something to do to do uh, to a vegetable. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Oh wow. I don't, know. I don't I don't know if it's greenwashing. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> well, Adidas already makes Adidas already makes recycled plastic shoes. Yeah. Has, uh, most of the sportswear companies, Nike, Nike does, Adidas does. The, the biggest and the most uh, the oldest one is uh, Patagonia. Patagonia has been doing this for the last 20, 30 years. And, um, you know, they're all sort of now catching up. So yes, yeah. it's better, but it's still very, a very small percentage of their actual sales. But at the yeah. same time, because the, like, like Nia said, it's 
demand from the consumers, which is why you'll see these categories of products in their product line continue to grow. So is the dollar the dollar vote with the dollar? Huh? Yeah, vote with the dollar. But also to, to add to that, um, I mean, recycled plastic for shoes, I, I'm, I'm okay with, but I think when you have recycled plastic clothes, like clothing made out of recycled plastic, you have to be very careful with that because yes, from one aspect you are reducing, um, I mean, you're, you're kind of closing this loop, but wearing clothes that come from recycled plastic, it ends up uh, releasing a lot of microplastics into the air which then eventually ends up back in our own bodies. So it's not the healthiest or uh, the best option for it's, the environment. It's, yeah. it's not circular in the end. It's not oh. exactly, it's, it's not as circular as we'd like it to be. But you know, in order to uh, try to solve that problem of, of microplastics from recycled clothing, there was another product created to avoid that. So um, it's a guppy bag, yes. Yes. So you basically put your clothes in that and then, you know, you can put it in the washing machine and, and it will keep all the microplastics intact. It wouldn't let it go into the oceans. Yeah. So, so yeah, you keep demanding better. They keep coming up with better things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the guppy bag is such a great solution for the washing because it, every time you wash them, you release a lot of microplastics, but also just wearing those products Every time you wear it and you move around, or just you know how you yeah. wear clothes, that releases microplastics into the air. And unfortunately, there is still no solution to catching those microplastics. And then you end up inhaling them because it's it's constantly around you. And I think now research has showed that uh, they found microplastics in the feet, like in in the womb of, of yeah. you know mothers who have have babies in their womb. And yeah, yeah, that was pretty upsetting to see. I yeah, have another I, question. Is, yeah. is there still room for that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah so here, uh, in my country, you, there is a uh, waste separation. So uh, they, 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 if you have a plastic and, and and stuff, you can they 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 pick it up in a separate bag. But uh, <clears throat> my impression is that it's um, this is um, not this is not really motivating people to reduce uh, the use of plastic bags and things like that because yeah, you think you yeah, it, it, anyway, it's I can I can put it in a separate bag. It's being recycled, so why should I why should I bother? What, yeah. what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I mean I, I I see where this question is coming from. Like people basically end up thinking that okay, like I'm recycling it, my job is done. It doesn't matter how much waste I produce because my job is done. But that's why we need to raise awareness that not everything you put into a recycling bin is going to be recycled um so yeah the, the, you just that's why we need to really reduce our waste um rather than just depend on on the waste management facilities to do the work for us yeah okay yeah always be the last option because it's still it takes energy it takes resources to recycle so uh as yeah. I, whenever we try to talk to anyone we always say recycling is your last option uh, and even then, it's not a perfect uh, it's not a perfect solution because so many products can only be recycled a certain number of times before it's not useful anymore. And a lot of places, like uh, even in, like where we are in the UAE, for example, we don't have all the recycling streams. So even though a product is recyclable, uh, it doesn't mean that it can be recycled. Yeah. And there also needs to be demand for that recycled material because, uh, yes, these waste management facilities, they can recycle the material. But in the end of the day, if there is no demand for that uh, product of recycled material to make something else, um, I mean, I, I suppose that would end up in landfill or it would just not end up being used and, you know, it's just yeah. a waste. Day. Yeah, there's usually less demand for recycled plastic for packaging just because it becomes of a lower quality. So plastic becomes of a lower quality when recycled again and again and again. So we would not need to find other ways to use it then, instead of just simply sending it to recycling. And it probably will then go into landfill as a result of that. It could be like, it's like a temporary solution. I mean, like yeah. the recycling of the plastic, it's not uh, in the end, it should, it should, should be replaced by something else. 
it's more yeah, sustainable. Definitely, definitely yes. Definitely. Any more questions? Any more comments? Oh, I haven't looked at the chat box. Okay, so Abe asks, um, Abe says, um, it's a broad question. I wanted to ask, what are your tips for anyone who is thinking to go zero waste? So going zero waste is not very uh, doable. Going low waste would be a better way to go. And I think adopting most of, uh, uh, like uh, adopting most of what we said uh, would actually help us go low waste. And I think the best way to go low waste, like Nia said, is to actually use this tree chart for most things that you intend to buy and try to conserve as many resources as you can. And Ape, just to add to that, start with things that you feel you can control. Like you don't need to start uh, with huge lifestyle changes, you know, just do things that you feel like are super easy to do. And for me, I, you know, two of the easiest things that I started out with was changing my plastic toothbrush to a bamboo one um, and then to a recycled toothbrush in the end because uh, I, I didn't really like the bamboo one too much. Um, and then the other one is, for example, just swapping from uh, a liquid soap, which comes in a plastic container to a bar of soap. Um, and you see, these are two things that are so easy and they're just not gonna change your life at all. So that's why I always say, start with things that are really not gonna have too much of an impact on your life, but can have an impact on the planet. Yeah, I think re replacing a lot of plastic in your house would also be a good first way to go. So water bottles, bags, you can always replace um, that with metal water bottles or reusable bags or things like that. Yeah. I have, I have um, another question if I sell yeah. it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, please. Well, um, uh, so with this slide on the screen, uh, I'm thinking about this, so I'm thinking about buying solar panels. And yeah. uh, I was thinking maybe, it's, could be a nice exercise to go through this. Uh, um, <laughs> what, what what should be your advice about this? To buy solar panel? Yeah, yeah. What, so what, where would I end up? Um, if I, Using I, this I card? Yeah. Yes, I yes mean, indeed. If you're, if you're buying solar, <laughs> for, for buying solar panels, do it. You don't even need to go yeah. through this. Right. It's but, like, do I need I it? From, yes. <laughs> need it? Yeah. Should I buy from a conventional brand or should I buy from a <laughs> <laughs> second hand? Buy, buy, from, buy from a brand that uh, produces good quality solar panels. Yeah, buy it from whoever you want. I think that, yes. be that is something you absolutely need. <laughs> Are you thinking of doing this for your home or is this for your business? No, for, for the home. No. Private. Yeah, because there are really nice, uh, I mean, for, for people doing it for their businesses, there are really nice options now of solar leasing. So you don't actually have to pay all that for uh, the solar panels themselves. These companies come and uh, install them for free and they maintain them for free for you. And all you do is uh, you pay them for the solar power that's generated from it. So you just go into a contract with them, pay them over time. And then after like 10, 15 years, the solar panels end up being yours and you're done with this contract and you have free electric I mean, yeah, free yeah. energy, yeah. Alicia says, make sure you use up your current items until they're used or worn before replacing them with eco-friendly options. That's, that's a very good thing. Right, that's a great, uh, that's definitely the number one thing is to, before we start replacing all our regular products with zero waste products or low waste products uh, use what we have first and then when you're in the market to buy look for things that are um, more eco-friendly yeah definitely any other and, questions oh sorry oh i was gonna ask the same thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah and guys feel free to ask as many questions as you like i mean the more yeah. questions the better yeah, feel free to share your experiences anything really like we love conversations too <laughs> so we we actually had a few um we actually had a few zero waste or low waste um 
products that we wanted to show you guys and we can show them to you now. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that if you have any questions or if you have any ideas that from those questions, from those products, uh, you can you can ask us or comment or say you like this, don't like this. Um, so if you want to start, Huda, you want to start and then we'll just go down the list and quickly show the products that we that we use that we like. Sure. So uh, one of my favorite lowest hacks is uh, switching out my uh, deodorant, um, you know, metal or plastic um, bottle into creating my own at home. Um, so I use, um, I basically use uh, coconut oil. So this is our, the jar that I use it with. Coconut oil, essential oil, and baking soda. And that's it. So I have, I, I usually have these ingredients at home. Uh, so instead of buying, you know, de new deodorants, I just mix it up, put it in this jar, and it stays for for a while, and it's really good. Um, so yeah, that's that's the one I use. Mia, do you want to go next? Yes. So I already mentioned two of my favorite ones, but to add to that, um, what one of my favorite swaps and also like an upcycling project for me was uh, making reusable makeup uh, remover pads. So. Um, Obviously, cotton pads, when, when you're really into skincare and uh, when you wear makeup, you end up wasting a lot of cotton pads um, daily. So I, I noticed that it was a lot of waste that I was creating. So I just I did a bit of research and I came across making my own reusable makeup pad. So I had an old cotton t-shirt and an old towel that I just no longer um, wanted or used. So I just cut them up into little rounds so this side is from the t-shirt and this is from the towel and it has to be a very soft um, material and I just stitch the two together and you know I, I just use it as I normally would remove my makeup or put my skincare or whatever and um, wash it and reuse it so I, I would advise if you do end up making some of these make a couple because uh, you don't want to be washing them every single day. Sasha? Um, so I did mention coconut oil, basically using it for oil moisturizing, like shaving purposes. But I do make my own perfume uh, with, um, what was my oil? Yeah, sorry, jasmine essential oil and water. And I just mix it up and then I spray it. And I think I made my first batch in, I think, uh, four months ago, easily. And it's still lasting very, very long. And it smells really, really nice. And I also use a bamboo toothbrush, a, a metal water bottle. So yeah, those are additional favorite hacks of mine. <laughs> so mine is uh, this tooth tablet. So it's basically toothpaste in the form of a tablet. And um, it's great because I don't have to worry about recycling the tube. The tubes aren't recyclable anyway. so. Uh, and I get it in a glass bottle, which I can reuse. So I can fill something else in it. Uh, that's one of my favorites. And I, uh, I also like the safety razor. Uh, apparently, they're supposed to last for 20 years. And uh, you recycle the blades, and that's it. Yeah. So, that's amazing. Where, where do you get the tablets from, uh, Natasha? Are, uh, these are in the UAE. Uh, I, if you look up uh, just tooth tablets, there are a lot of companies internationally making it. Uh, I choose the ones with fluoride because, uh, I mean, as much as uh, research as the research that's been done, the amount of fluoride in toothpaste isn't uh, isn't high enough to harm you, but it's required for your teeth. So I prefer with fluoride, but you do get okay. both options. That's really nice. Thanks. Any more questions and comments? Right, yeah. I'm guessing not. <laughs> <laughs> But okay, so since we don't have more questions or comments, uh, would everyone be okay to take a group picture? 
Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, that's perfect. So we would request people who want to be a part of the picture to turn on their cameras. And if you don't want to be a part of the picture, you can keep your cameras off and we will um, uh, black your name out. And yep, so big smiles, everybody. All right, one, two, three. I'm just gonna take one more. I'm gonna swipe that one back, okay. Okay, that's perfect. All right, thank you so much for attending our uh, session today and feel free to contact us if you have any further questions, um, any further conversations you wanna have with us, please feel free to just contact us. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you everyone, it was great thank to meet you all.